Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. Excited today to have Heno Mutala with us. And Heno is a finished basketball coach, we'll call, but most people will remember you from your playing days. Uh, played at the University of Utah, lost in the national final against Kentucky, and was the first finished player to play in the NBA. As I understand it, you weren't the first to be drafted. Is that correct? Yes. So, well, first of all, thanks for having me, Chris. Yeah, we had, I believe, three players got drafted out of uh, BYU back in 70s and early 80s. So uh, we do have a longer history in top level basketball than uh, a lot of people, even in Finland, believe. <laughs> Which is great. But definitely, I mean, you're one of the most famous. And a lot of that has to do with your NCAA collegiate success. And I know we could spend the whole podcast on Rick Majera stories. But we want to get right to focusing. So, again, thanks for coming on. I know this is going to be excited for everyone. Just so people know a little bit about what you're doing now, you're involved with the Finnish Basketball Association, but most importantly, the Helsinki Basketball Academy, which is the development academy in Finland focusing on elite player development. And you're the academy that helped develop Lori Markinen, correct? Can you give us yes. a little bit of a feel for the academy and some of the work you do there? Yeah, well, in a nutshell, HBA is a Finnish Basketball Federation's high school academy. So when the kids get to us, they are either 15 or 16. They have just finished, you know, under 16 European Championship summer. And then high school in Finland starts on 10th grade and usually ends on 12th. So it's a three-year program in a lot of cases. Some players want to stay extra year. So, so players are between, I would say, 16 and 19 when they are at the HBA. They all go to the same high school right here. McLaren Sports High School is the most prestigious sports high school in the country. I went to the same school, so it's uh, very convenient. Our gym is just across the parking lot, and we recruit basically the best players in the country. We try to find uh, and locate the best talent for the future to help our national team programs and obviously help those individual players. Well, give uh, us a feel a little bit, because again, Finnish basketball is on the rise. And you've been competitive at a very high level. And a lot of that has to do with philosophy. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But coaches most directly will connect with the story of Lori. So give us a feel. So when did he come to the academy? What were some of the things that helped him develop? Just to give coaches a little bit deeper feel for what you guys do. Lori, uh, he spent his first high school year. So he's 10th grade back in his home city of Uvascula, which is about three and a half hours away. And then he and his mom decided to move to Helsinki and come to HBA so he has a chance to, you know, hopefully train more, train better, and concentrate on basketball a little more. Um, and uh, so he spent his last two junior and senior year with us. In Lauri's case, he was obviously very advanced at that age already, at the age of 16, 17, when he got to us. Very focused, probably the most focused high school player I've seen or had a chance to work with. You didn't have to motivate him. You didn't have to push him to go hard in, in any kind of drills. So, and then he, he played, we play in the second highest men's league in Finland. First division, what it's called. So our high school players play against usually a lot of older players, some Americans. There's some professionals in our league. Mostly they're, I probably call them semi-pros. So a lot of spent two good years with us. I was able to uh, get to the men's national team you know, during those in the last year and HBA and our national team programs, we really work hand in hand. So we're basically extension of our national team programs during the season. It's great. And, and as you mentioned already, like people don't really understand how many Finnish players there are. There's a lot playing in the NCAA. There's a lot playing overseas in different leagues and, you know, Finnish basketball is on the rise. And we're going to get into some of those reasons why a small basketball playing country has been able to develop basketball and being able to compete at a high level. And I want to start with something that we've kind of discussed a little bit, I've seen you talk about, and that's this concept of skipping fundamentals, which is getting right into some of the technical, tactical, and in talking about this, do you feel there's a little bit of a danger in how we're coaching the game nowadays in terms of skipping fundamentals? Can you talk about that? Because I think it's a really important point for coaches to understand. <laughs> I do believe, and it's not mocking, you know, and talk about basketball was better 20 years ago. It's not. I mean, you know, the best college teams of today, they would definitely uh, win the teams that I played on. But I do believe that there's a lot of analytics, a lot more information out there. And it's hard for, and I'm talking about now, but junior coaches, let's say between 10 and 16 year old. I think there's a big danger that those coaches 
take, you know, they watch NBA, watch EuroLeague, watch these YouTube videos and try to implement those things straight to their afternoon practice with kids who don't have the physical, the mental and skill level to get to those things. And I've seen, it could be just coincidence, but I've seen the last couple of years when we get in players and, and we talk about the best players, or at least the best talent in the country. You know, just for example, let's take a just a, a chest pass. I know it's it's a hot topic in some coaching circles. You don't need to use a chest pass anymore, this and that. If you look at an NBA game, every fast break is started usually with a chest pass, unless it's a baseball pass. Even today, I mean, if, if I was at work, you know, swing a ball on offense, and I know, you know, the weak side, they're not trying to deny the pass. But I throw a chest pass. It's sharper. It's it's more accurate. Uh, so. And we've seen players who have a hard time doing it, executing a simple chest pass. So I, I think, and I, I've heard you talk about it, I think we need to really hit the fundamentals early and often, but don't spend so much time as maybe our generation did. I think we're all about fundamentals. So I think our generation knows how to do a layup better than today's kids, but we don't know how to do maybe a full speed layup or, or with side steps and this and that. So I think it's a fine line. And also, I, th I think shooting is an another thing. I think I call it the Steph Curry effect. You know, he, especially in Europe, you know, there's three-point line with, with little kids early on. And I think players, I mean, it's the new dunk. I know back in the day, ever hoping, when can I dunk? Now it's when can I hit a three-pointer? If you go to go to watch a, any kids practice or just free gym time, everybody tries to heave three-point shots way before they have any kind of capacity to do it. And that kind of develops bad shooting mechanics and then how to correct them later and what you're basically talking about is that these foundation skills and the chest pass in my opinion again is not useless it's just not used as much but it is a foundation skill and some of these conversations seem to give us the impression we should be skipping foundation skills and we shouldn't be the chest pass should be a basis for developing other skills and more often the chest passes is outside your body and it leads to the one hand outside your body and different things like that. So I 100% agree with you. And then for shooting, the part that comes clear to me is, I'm sure you see this at the HBA. How many players come to you at this point and release the ball from their chest? And that is a symptom of them wanting to shoot it from too far, too young. They shoot it from what we call position two, rather than lifting the ball and getting it elbow above eyes, et cetera. Is that what you're seeing? Absolutely. And, you know, shootings, that's been kind of, uh, you know, I'm assistant coach at HBA. I work with our head coach, Ante Koskalainen, who's, who's always also in charge of the under-16, our national team program. So uh, he sees the incoming class and, and all that. But, you know, kind of you know, part of my responsibility is, is teaching our players how to shoot, the mechanics, and, and even more the individual little techniques. Ante is more, more in charge of the five-on-five -five game. But obviously we do everything together. But... Uh, it is. I'm trying to think of a player who comes in and the only thing I would just tell him, hey, let's just get repetition. Your shot is, to my eye, as good as you can as a 16-year-old. I don't think we've had one really in, in, the, in the six, seven years of our existence. And I, now, it was just another day I was thinking when I knew I was coming in the podcast and, and whether it's Steph Curry or not, I mean, I, I agree. Someone told, you know, talked in your podcast, I think he's the single player who's changed our game more than anyone in history in, in a lot of ways because so many people think that they can do what he can do because he's physical. I mean, he's not a massive guy. He's not an incredible athlete like Michael Jordan was. He's not Shaq. So uh, in a positive and negative, I think it's great that we're shooting a lot of threes, but the mechanics is that there's a lot more juniors who are not doing using the proper mechanics, at least to my liking. Well, and for sure, and, and for some of the things that you do, and we'll talk about shooting a little bit here, but I know like there's no way around it. There has to be isolated training for those players. And and I read it, or I think you talked about it, about Laurie Markkinen. What was one of the things that you worked with his shot on helping him get a higher release, was it, or what was it? Yeah, well, you know, in, in loudest game, and he's, I wish I would have loved shooting as much as he did. I mean, I mean, and now, talk, you know, talking to his parents and obviously now reading articles, I mean, he... He didn't spend any time playing with Legos, you know, and much as I did. I mean, he was shooting early on, as soon as he got his ball in his hands. So he had the repetitions. He has just a natural, great wrist movement, 
release, all that. But he did start his his shooting from really low position. I think he, you know, he was a he didn't grow. He was a guard all the way up to about 14 years old. So he didn't start growing until you know 14, 15, right there. So uh, and and he was skinny one too. So he had to and he loved to shoot. So that's a recipe for just what we talk. That's a re- I mean, if you're skinny, you don't have power, and you want to shoot threes, you tend to have a lower and lower release point. I don't think Lauri's case, that's probably what had happened. But he had, I mean, unbelievable natural. He all looked good, but just it was a low release point. And then as soon as he started, you know, getting the release point higher. He started more and more from left side to right side. You know, he's right-handed, but he started from left side. And that was something we tried to correct together as much as possible. And and it really wasn't un- until his rookie year with the Bulls last season that, you know, he noticed. And then, you know, he, he texted me, one, I think it was probably November, that, you know, now I feel like, you know, I'm going straight up. And, you know, even his, his case, his shot does not look anything like it looked three years ago. The foundation is great. So, I mean, he's done all the work, you know, one can imagine. But he had just a couple of things that he needed to correct. And also, you know, he had some issues. He had some, you know, normal tendonitis that all the teenagers tend to have. And we have a lot of those. And one similar thing that I've noticed is they, you know, they're, they're usually it's their right knee with the right hand shooter that they twist. You know, it's just not aligned with the left feet. And the knee gets a little too much stress on it. And it could be just my thinking, but all those guys who we have a little tendonitis, their shooting mechanics, you know, with legs is uh, kind of similar with the, and Lowry had the same little issue. So I think we corrected three things, the leg, the release point, and getting, go straight, you know, straight up on the right side of the face. Well, and that's interesting that you mentioned, because that's another symptom of shooting from too far, from too young, or shooting with a heavier ball or on higher hoops, whatever it is, is that, and I see that more and more, is that bringing it across your body to generate extra power and definitely not an efficiency as you move up in levels. And I have many players that we try and try and work on changing that as well. So those are some great insights into shooting and and we might circle back a little bit to that, but you know, I know there's another thing that we talked about a little bit about skipping fundamentals and this concept of seeing Brad Stevens run a play and saying, okay, I can now run that play. And again, that's one of the dangers of this, process is that we have so much information we see all these great plays and we think they all work but the reality is not all plays work for all levels and not all teams so talk about that a little bit relative yeah i mean you know i mean if you compare it to any other sport can you find a sport where a junior coach of let's say 14 year old kids can show something on a video of a best in the world and then they can implement it in practice in basketball in a lot of ways you can you can take a boston celtics great half court set and he works on under under 14 level so because the defense is also under 14 you know but if you can't show a 14 year old sprinter Usain Bolt's Olympic final where he goes nine and a half seconds so hey let's do the same thing or polyvault coach can't tell 14 year old guy to a hey, little boy hey, hey, let's jump six meters so um, it kind of goes back to the skip and fundamentals I think there's a danger that a lot of us coaches are being in the same boat that we think that teaching tactical things develops great players. If someone can execute at the age of 14 or 16 a great hammer screen set, couple screens and dives and all that, and we get a wide open three, that automatically those five players are great players. I think it's, you know, there's some truth to it. You need to be smart to be able to execute a play. But also, uh, I think the coaches who play simpler in a junior level and really rely on fundamentals, passing, shooting, moving, rather than setting up great set plays, I think they tend to produce more players. Well, and this is a great segue to what we're going to talk about, which is really Finland basketball and, and knowing who you are as a country or as a team or as a basketball program and having a real understanding of who you are and what you need to do to be successful. Because the basics of this is Finland can't compete with the world if they do exactly what the world does. They need to come up with their own philosophy, their own understanding of who they're going to be, and then you have to commit to it. And the Finnish Federation has talked about, I believe it's 10-year kind of plan that you look ahead for about 10 years. Can you give us a feel for what Finnish basketball is? And then we'll dive deeper into each topic 
a little bit in terms of the philosophy of how you guys play. Yeah, to circle back what you started with, you know, we have 20,000 licensed players. That includes a six-year-old girls or seven-year-old old retired men who want to play senior league. You need to have so every age group is a, maybe five, seven, eight hundred players. So we 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 can't compete with sheer numbers. If you know, our competition is is Europe. If we want to beat France, Turkey, Serbia, Croatia, we don't have the basketball players. Lithuania has over ten times more players in every age group that we do. So we tried originally when uh, we really started uh, kind of the the new face of our men's national team program early 2000s when Hendrik Detman returned from being Germany's national team head coach with Dirk Nowitzki and, and the other guys. Our identity was we try to be more aggressive on defense and offense than everybody else. And, and it still holds true today. And it's you know, over 10 years later. And, you know, we're not the biggest, we're not the most athletic, but we can be the most aggressive team on defense. And that's, and it teach me a point too, because I, I've played in the NBA, I've played in a Euro league at that point, And I knew the roster that we have. And then we start putting in these things. I was like, well, that it's crazy. How, why we, you know, let's play safe and, you know, but we want to attack on defense. We don't want to react to offense and let the, maybe a better athlete to uh, try to beat us. We want to dictate where he goes on defense. And we, rely very heavily on the, on the help side defense. We try to create what we call the weak side I or weak side L, depending on obviously the weak side offensive spacing. Sorry, coach, and I'm going to interrupt just quickly because I love this. Because too many people think aggressive defense and denial defense is only for athletic teams. And again, you're proving this. I mean, you're not the most athletic. You're not the longest. You're not the tallest. But it's really any type of pressure defense denial defense is more about committing to a philosophy and being all in. And I love this because I'm a big believer in that. And I think the U S model is almost too pack line oriented now in terms of defensive philosophy. And this is again saying, if we've got to beat the best team in our league, we can't do exactly what they do because they're better at it than we are. So we Absolutely. need to find something that works for us. Absolutely. I, I think, works even more in advance, you know, to help bigger players. I was a pretty mobile big guy, so I didn't have any any trouble trying to deny passing lanes up to half court or, you know, hard showing on every ball screen out to 30 feet maybe. But, you know, we had some bigger, more rugged centers than I have, and a normal coach's approach would be, uh, yeah, don't go outside the three-point line. Let's, you know, let's do a wall or ice the ball screens. I've seen players who traditionally – would have no business being out there, you know, doing a, or executing a great hard show ball screen defense or red as we call it. And it works. I mean, if you get into it, you believe those players, they just need to anticipate a little more, but they can get out there, you know, with their big body, high hands. And it's, uh, it really, it's really shown and helped me now in my coaching career that there's no, you can't, I think as coaches, we try to limit the abilities of players. We think that if you're big, you can't do this and this. Or if you're small, you know, you can't front the post or you can't be a good post defender. So our system has really uh, shown me a lot. And, and put it this way, I'm, I'm a lot more wide open on my thoughts because of my national team experience of the last 10 years about basketball because we'd be able to execute and, and play great defense, aggressive defense against, I mean, world-class teams. And you might think it's a brave system, but again, when you commit to it fully, it's not as big a leap as you think. And let's dive some, get into some depth here on the defense. So what are we doing on the ball? What are we doing on the ball in the finish system? We try to control the ball as early as possible. Our make or miss, we try to get the ball under control, you know, hopefully three-quarter court, no half court by the latest. And it, we really set the tone with the on-ball defender. If the on-ball defender is just, you know, doing your zigzag slide drill and just stay in front of the ball and the opposing ball handler can see over him, he don't have to turn, then it's, you know, it's just for a show. And I think so many times, I think we basically, unless you're really pressuring, I think we're just spending energy. Why don't you just run back to three-point line start? I think so many players uh, or system, you know, we just, we're sliding in front of a player, but we're not doing anything. So we'll try to control the ball, 
how would you try to limit the, the swing of the ball, deny the trailer as hard as we can. But everything starts with the on-ball pressure. And obviously, don't get beat, but stay in front, high hands, and you know, try to dictate where he goes. That's great. So we're starting with ball pressure, and then one pass away, everyone's in denial. Yeah, everybody's and, and denied. What, what are you talking about in terms of stance and uh, positioning there? Well, you know, let, let's say if the ball is you know, going up on the right side, I'm denying a trailer. Obviously, you no, know, I try to see the ball over my left shoulder and put my forearm on, on the trailer guy's uh, hip and, and have my left hand really active. You know, we treat it. And on the ball, part of the denial is, is the on-ball defender. Let's say if you're denying on, on the right wing, you're denying the ball, your right hand, middle hand, or the, the higher side hand is up because you, with that hand, you take away also the reverse, the swing pass. So when you're on the ball, you're not just responsible stopping your ball. Your other hand is taking away the most obvious next pass. And then, you know, on, on the, let's say if, if you're on the, on the weak side, weak, on the bottom of the weak side eye, your hand needs to be on, on the passing lane to the opposite corner. And the only thing you need is just to wave the hand right there and show your five fingers somewhere in that passing lane. And that bullet pass is not available. When we talk about denial, so we're, are we talking about full arm in the passing lane? Are we talking about yes. body in the passing lane? Which... Um, well, I, I think it's kind of half and half. Maybe, you know, maybe a shoulder and then a hand on, on, a, on a passing lane. And obviously, the closer the ball is, I like to teach, and I, that this is the way Coach Majerus taught us, you know, I try to create contact to the offensive player. I put my forearm to his hip. My low leg is kind of taking away the direct backdoor pass. So I'm not fully butt to the ball i'm a little bit on an angle and pushing the guy outside and at least for me you know i was that way i was able to compensate maybe if i was guarding a quicker guy i was able to dictate i know where he's going if he's going to get a catch he's, he needs to go outside and he really really have and it's actually the the one we started doing with coach Majors was uh actually at the final four when uh, alex jensen he's now assistant coach with the jazz when we were getting ready to guard uh, Vince Carter. So we did not want to get backdoor lobs. And then, of course, Majerza, uh, I think that was the first time he really brought that technique. And, and I, I really bought it. And I think we started using it more and more. So uh, you deny, but don't turn your whole back to the ball. Well, it's a great point that you just said, too, about forcing the catch higher. Like, denial is not about steals. It's about disruption and forcing an offense to be run higher than it wants to be, to space it farther from the basket. It's not just about steals. So I think that's a great point for everyone to understand. Yeah. Oh, I think it's – and another thing, like, <laughs> we going back to Coach Majors, uh, he always said, you know, steals don't come by stealing. They come from positioning. The best guy, the guys who are best, you know, and maybe the top of the steal st- statistics, usually they're not great defenders. They take risks. They take chances. And so it's a, we don't want to steal on defense. We want to erupt the movement of the ball. We don't want them to be able to swing the ball and move the ball freely. That's the whole purpose of uh, the way we play defense. Well, and if we think about European basketball in particular, and we think about the beauty of the game is there's, there's a lot of ball movement. There's a lot of false actions prior to the main action. So if you're thinking about your philosophy, then you're thinking about taking them out of a lot of those options. And really for us, when we do denial, and we've had teams that do situational denial or full denial, it's really about forcing teams to get out of their offense and to be more isolation oriented. So we know exactly where they're attacking and how we're helping. And it helps simplify the game, to be honest, doesn't it in a way, if you do it right? Oh, absolutely. And we and again, for me, at first, it was, it was hard because we really didn't need a game plan. We denied everybody, no matter if you're shooter, non-shooter, seven foot one, slow center, or six foot, you know, little speed bug. We denied everybody past half, I mean, almost to a half court. Yes, I mean, in theoretically, I mean, in reality, yeah, you get a catch, you know, at, at the 40 feet or whatever, 35 feet. But everybody, you need to deny at least step or two above three-point line. And same thing on the ball screens we hard show on every single player no matter if you shoot or non-shooter we didn't care who the big was you know to be honest i think in the, in the 15 years i think tony parker is the only guy that we changed the game plan and we went under with him pushing under because we let him shoot and you know that way we were able to beat france a couple times but yeah it's also simple and i think on a, going back to junior basketball coaching i think you have too many ways of doing 
a lot of things, you're not really doing anything. And our philosophy of teaching young players, not only HBA, but then certainly other national team programs, when they learn this aggressive style of defense, it's a lot easier going to whatever program you're going next when you become your first professional team. And then let's say if they ice the ball screens, well, it's lots easier for a 6'10 big guy than to ice the ball screen if he knows how to hard show. But if, if you let your big guys to always just sit in the paint, be passive, then he goes to the first pro team and coach wants to be aggressive. That's a long road. I think we try to teach the hardest way of playing basketball, the defense, and then you can certainly ease up on that. So there's a lot of that, you know, behind that too. But in reality, we have started to, you know, switch more ball screens, one through four. You know, we don't deny the corner on the ball side anymore. We're a little bit on the open stance and a little things that we have changed, but still the principles, if you go watch under 16, Finnish national team, girls team, and our men's national team at the World Cup, the defense principle should look the same. And that's impressive for an organization of any kind, even a smaller one, to get everyone kind of in sync with the philosophy. It's got to be very unique and, and outstanding for us to learn about, too. Let's talk about who's stopping the ball then on a dribble drive. So we're not helping one pass away. We're helping at the rim. Is that correct? So you talk yes. about the weak side yes. eye or yes. L? We have, yeah, we have, you know, we have a weak side eye, you know, meaning, you know, let's yeah. say there's two guys on a weak side. We have a... We create a, a letter I, but we do it pretty much on, on the basket line. So we, we, we want our guys all the way in the middle of pain. So then the next question is, well, we're going to leave the skip pass wide open. Yes, but we have a very hard ball pressure, high hands. So if the ball handler can just pick up the ball and execute a great skip pass, then the on-ball defender, that's his job. Again, like we talked earlier, his hand needs to take away the bullet pass. If it's a high arcing skip pass to the weak side, we can get to it. Are you Xing out on the weak side or is it you're just recovering to your own? Dave Smart is one of the best coaches in the world and now you can learn from him with never before available access. Three all access practices and one defensive coaching clinic are available at davesmartbasketball.com. What makes these all access practice and clinic videos so unique? Dave Smart has won 12 national championships and has a winning percentage of 92%. Dave Smart's Force We Can defensive system is world-renowned and has never been shared in this way before. Dave Smart has a winning record in over 50 games versus NCAA Division I teams, having beaten Wichita State, Baylor, Wisconsin, and many others. Dave Smart is recognized by Jay Wright, Mick Cronin, Jay Triano, and many other top coaches in the world as one of the best minds in basketball. Learn from one of the greatest minds in the game who opened his doors and shared the game with us from one of the most successful basketball programs in the world. Go to davesmartbasketball.com now to learn more and to purchase all four videos. Well, it depends. It depends. There's been some exiting done in, in the last few years. I like more, if we can, let's get back to our own. But obviously, there's a even a hint of, let's say, one dribble drive. Then the low guy, he needs to step up. And then the top of the eye, he usually takes the first pass out. But what we, I think what we've been able to, uh, oh, a difference of, in a lot of defenses, uh, if there's no ball side post occupied by offensive player, we bring the, lo- the bottom of the eye guy to fill the empty post. So there's a, but in, then in a lot of cases, then there's going to be three guys on a weak side, you know, without the ball. I mean, just if there's no ball side post guy, there's no three guys on the wing on the ball side offensive, you know, if, if you follow me. So, yep. so in a lot of those cases, if we fill the empty post, that means we have a weak side L and I, and then the L. So then we fill the empty post, and then behind that, we have another guy on the top, and then right maybe on the opposite side, three-second line. So in the Finnish system, if you're getting beat on defense, it's they're beating you in that weak side corner? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. The veteran guys at the national team practices, when I was still playing, you know, if you get in trouble, just close your eyes and throw a bullet past your corner. <laughs> you know, that, that's a trick to beat us. But And yes, we, there's been some teams that, you know, 
they beat us. They know how to play against us and uh, whatever reason. But then you can always find the reasons. You know, we don't get the ball under pressure. We don't control the ball. The high hands are not there. I mean, it's incredible that with active, good hands on ball and four guys off the ball, what a difference it makes. I mean, and we charted, there was one particular summer when we were great at that with the men's national team. And you could see in the statistics greatly. And it's, it's funny. I mean, I, I'm sure it's the same thing in Canada. If you tell five 15-year-olds, oh, let's play zone, what's the first thing they do? Everybody raises their hands, right? Let's play zone defense. Then if, if you are uh, man-to-man, everybody have their hands down. So if we can get man-to-man defense, off-ball defenders use their hands, the court becomes, I mean, it really shrinks in the eye of the ball handler. So we talked about aggressive on the ball. We've talked about aggressive off the ball, one pass away. We've talked about that you're going to show on all ball screens. The one thing we've missed so far is how are we defending the post? What's our philosophy on defending the post? We used to be very aggressive and strict to front the post. And it really, you know, to get, we kind of forget it and we, we try to go back to it. But it's, so in a perfect world, we, we front the post. If that doesn't happen, because we have that strong weak side help, and then, but let's if if the ball gets in the post, usually on the first dribble we push the on ball defender turns his chest to the baseline, high hands just sticks his nose usually to the post guy's shoulder, and just starts driving him to the baseline. As a result, you know the offensive player he need he either travels, or he needs to put the ball on the floor and spin. And then we are ready on the first dribble without really a, even a call. It's automatic. Boom. We come and double. So as a result, we be able to have great success against NBA centers, EuroLeague great centers. And even more so, it is absolutely lethal at the junior levels in the, in the European championships. Because under 16, under 18, even the top players in Europe, a lot of them can't handle it. And it becomes all, you can almost take away a post game. They don't even try to put the ball inside. There's been some players who absolutely destroyed us. Marcus all with Spain. He was too big, too good of a shooter. We couldn't get to him. Australia started to get you know, catch uh, off the block against us. And that's when we get in trouble because if the weak side double help, or, you know, help guys too far away, you can't get to that. So it's a risky defense also I mean, because if the help is not there, it's a spin and dunk. So five guys needs to be on the same page. But it is it is something that's still, that's probably what, if you ask people around Europe who've been to a lot of the European Championships coaches, who, that's probably one thing that they tell us. I mean, what we still do uniquely. Then I've started to see more colleges doing it a little bit like that. But again, we don't necessarily, we don't see who's the guy in the post. It can be average backup center or the all-star level center. We do everybody the same. Because, so, we are on the same page and everybody can, because if everybody doesn't buy into that, it's a wide open shot somewhere. Well, it's great because as you said, it simplifies again. You know exactly what you're doing when it goes in the post and so does so do the four other players. And the benefit is, again, you're disrupting, potentially forcing a turnover. You're just definitely disrupting the flow of someone's offense. And then the other thing that you said is about fronting the post. And we used to front the post religiously. And then since the game has changed so much, And really, again, how many teams try and throw it in the post to score anymore that we've adjusted and said we're not going to front it either anymore because now we're able to cover the weak side more, which is really more the danger of the game. So it's interesting that you said that because that aligns, I think, with the way the modern game is being played too. So great stuff. Absolutely. So transitioning to offense then, because, again, I've watched some of your uh, World Cup qualifying, and we won't get into that because that's a whole different conversation. But watching your team play uh it seems to be some things that stand out on offense and that's one there seems to be a lot of cutting and you seem to play through the post on offense not to score but to be passers can you just give us a perspective a little bit on some of the offensive philosophy that Finnish teams play with well i think the basic fundamentals are that we rely heavily on on the ball and player movement and probably in that order you know we have a saying pass to the open man if there's an open guy you pass to him and so we try to generate energy. I mean, more guys touch the ball, more guys see, you know, get touches, the more energy flows between the players and then 
everybody's feeling better. And uh, as a result, we are in those crucial moments at the end, everybody has confidence. So, and then obviously we were probably the first European team to start shooting 30 plus threes a game at a national team level. And this is going back to probably 12 years ago. You know, when I moved to center position and, and I, you know, I was a three point shooter as well. So, but now we kind of lost that advantage because now it's the norm, even at the junior level. And we try to play fast. Just like I said, we try to be aggressive. So we, we make or miss. We try to cross the half court by passing. We don't really, especially in junior level and at HBA, we don't have a point guard really. In the men's level, you know, it, they still use more of a point guard. But but even then, you know, if, if three, four man gets the rebound, he's pushing it. And then the other guys, you know, become wings and, and guards. We want to establish front rim runner every time. And it doesn't have to be five man, but usually it is. So we try to, you know, attack with that runner and cut her inside. And, and if we can get an early post catch, boom, go and score. But like you said, one of our fundamentals is, you know, get the ball inside and then we dive from weak side. Usually it's, uh, you know, 45 degrees or, or trailer who dives and creates pressure on defense. And then, you know, behind that, maybe there's a down screen or a field cut or what have you. Pretty simple, really. I mean, if someone's open, pass them the ball. But yeah, not easy. It, it is simple, but I think it goes back to, you know, we're very unselfish society. And, and I've more and more of, I've kind of studied basketball and traveled and, and talked to people. There's a very lot of similarities in the way one country plays certain sports. We can't separate our society from our, the way our basketball players behave. We're a very unselfish society. We work well together. No one really wants to be a superstar as a per se i mean we usually we don't have a lot of goal scorers we have great defensive players a lot of in any sport great goalies in, in soccer so you know we're on selfish team so why not play you know unselfishly we'd be playing you know one-on-one uh, off the dribble basketball that's not who finnish people are which again makes sense in terms of uh, the philosophy and then how you arrived at that which is brilliant but so less ball screen is what I would see relative to Europe if I'm watching a Finnish team play. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, we do run ball screens at HBA, at national team level. I think we have – now there's such a huge overflow of ball screen in Europe and, and NBA everywhere that we try to go a little bit away from that. You know, so many junior players, that's where they feel comfortable. You know, as soon as there's a broken play – center automatically starts running for a ball screen and that's fine but but i think again if we are better fundamentally you know we can we can certainly get a good shot without a ball screen just like you know golden state warriors i love watching them and they play by far the least ball screens in the nba but i think what we try to get is a what we call an early ball screen and it might not even be a really a ball screen it might be kind of the the ball handler and the big the trailer kind of crossing at half court or a little after half court. So you try to create an advantage five on four right there. And then when you try to maybe penetrate, get in the paint, pass, then get a little advantage. Then we try to multiply the little advantage for bigger advantage, maybe with pass or, or one dribble, another pass. And so that's really the philosophy that we don't, we hardly ever try to attack from the first little advantage. We try to get to the, you know, get it bigger, maybe the first pass or second pass, third pass. Well, and it strikes me when you say Golden State that there are a lot of similarities and, and obviously your system precedes what they've been doing, but it's just, you know, they try and play through the post and run a lot of multiple actions off the post to not score in the post, but to score out of the post. Yeah. And I guess the question that comes up from that is, like, obviously there's a lot of read and react with whatever you do within that, but do you have some set actions that happen when the ball goes in the post or is it mainly, as you said, a weak side cutter and some freedom to be able to read and play out of that? Well, and I think the whole root of our thinking, we talk a lot about triangle offense in, in the mid-90s with Coach Detman before he went to Germany. Obviously, that time, that was a big trend with the with Chicago Bulls' success. And then kind of the triangle became a, a cuss word, you know, for a lot of players, you know, all of a sudden it wasn't cool to be playing triangle. So we just stopped talking about triangle, but as we all know, 
basketball is triangle. I mean, you have either three guys or two guys. So, so we really, the root of the whole thing, it, you get the ball in the post. We run the same, what we call a bull screen, the inbounder. I mean, the, the guy who passes to the post, he goes screen the top. Or now what we, the HBA, we call it a, a splash screen, you know, from the Golden State Splash Brothers. That's kind of reverse of that. So the guy, you know, from the trail, let's say a trailer spot, he kind of side screens the uh, post feeder. So things like that, but those are not set plays. Those are reads and better the communication is, you know, better those screens work with our young guys. You know, it's been a struggle at, at times, you know, they don't call. And then as a result, two guys hit each other right in the middle when both guys go screen. And then, you know, just a simple dive. So, you know, if the ball gets in, the, in one of our really, like I said five minutes ago, if the ball goes inside, we try to dive from the weak side because that creates a lot of pressure on the, on the weak side defense. And then when the guard behind that fills the uh, top spot, you know, he's usually wide open. So traditionally, you know, teams would maybe on the post, we maybe try to downscreen the weak side, but we dive strong, you know, towards the ball, towards the net, and uh, create a pressure with a strong, hard cut. Great. I'm glad, I'm glad you were in defense of the triangle because, again, I totally agree with you that it's got a bad name. And unfortunately for people, it's, it exists in every part of basketball, even if it's not just in the pure triangle system. The parts of it all exist. So it's wonderful stuff. And I think every coach at any level who's interested in basketball should study the triangle deeply because the concepts, again, if you're just picking pieces of it, concepts apply to everything that you do. So that's great. Talked about flow. You talked about transition. What are we doing for set plays? Are we running set plays within the system? Yes, Coach Deadman, he's a his staff. They have a a number of set plays, and to get the best players best shots when needed, and it's usually uh, you know kind of game to game what's working, and and if teams are switching a lot, you know a lot of that stuff. And we tend to have a lot of trouble with the teams who switch. For example, Russia in the last game, and and a few other teams who switch. Uh, because we don't screen a lot, so uh, you know cutting teams are maybe a little easier defended if you don't when you switch. But there's a definitely a, we used to run horn screens, you know, five ten years ago. We don't do that anymore. But uh, but a lot of them are action to the second or, or maybe third side. You know, various down screens. We try to get shooters open with it, maybe some daggers or even triple screens. But everything there's always a post guy, and then. Uh, somehow uh, work him in there. I think one of the great, really good actions we'd be using a lot in the various ways is that after a post catch, you know, he takes a couple of really hard dribbles towards middle and, you know, kind of full speed uh, down the hill handoff with the guard on the top. You know, the guard, maybe he received a down screen on the weak side and he curls into that handoff. But when the center who's able to dribble two, three times really hard towards the basket line, you know, in the middle of the court, that's a hard, you can usually isolate a guard against that post defender because that becomes an automatic switch, you know, if it's executed well. And But, you know, nothing out of no ordinary. There's definitely set plays. And I think the older guys, they want more and more set plays because, you know, they play in the different pro teams and they run those, you know, every day. So, but with the junior national teams and, and our HBA program, we use a lot less set plays because I think the young guys are more open-minded. They don't have their way set already, and, and they can believe that even more easily that with just with great movement, good speed, good passing, you can get a good shot. So in a lot of ways, it's easier to implement offense for these uh, talented young players than it is for uh, older players who are already 30, 35 years, and they've kind of learned their way. And it's uh, you know it might be tough for them to come in and – not see the set plays that they've used to. Well, it's like all good coaches are salesmen and or saleswomen and have to sell it and give them a good reason why. But I think, again, there's so many things that you've shared that are, are useful to all levels of coaches. But like for high school coaches and AAU coaches, understanding how national teams work is really important because they're dealing with the same concepts that you're dealing with in the sense that your players are coming from other programs they're coming for a relatively short period of time before you play games and you're trying to bring them together in a way. So I assume this common identity, this common philosophy that exists throughout Finland 
helps you do that in a better way, especially if we talk about this World Cup qualifying where I'm guessing literally your roster was different every single qualifying weekend that happened. So is that part of the goal of this philosophy as well, is that there's synergy within? Well, certainly, certainly. And, and especially it helps when if you're a player, you, you're at the under-16 national team this summer, and then next summer, you know, you get up to the under-18s. The coaches and, and maybe some